Um, hi, I'm Chris Weisopel. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Veracode. And I'm here with Giuseppe Travato, who is a principal security engineer on our uh, research team. And we thought we would um, hop on hop on on live here and um, discuss this latest log4j vulnerability. If uh, people have questions they want to ask, there's a, there's a chat. Uh, this is a new tool for me today, so um, not not. We, we, we might have some growing pains here, um, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to uh, use, use the chat feature um, just so we can see those. So I'm just gonna start off and uh, sort of describe high level what, what we're seeing here at, at Veracode. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Giuseppe some details around, you know, how do you exploit this? How does this happen? What are we gonna do about it? Um, but essentially, Log4j is the most popular um, logging framework on um, on the Java platform, and so you know there's literally thousands and thousands of enterprise and you know commercial applications that are using um, Log4j. It's been around for quite a while. Um, this is this vulnerability is in version two um, of, of of Log4j. Um, and uh, it was for any version two up to the version that was released um, very early this morning, GMT by the Apache team is vulnerable. So if you're using Log4j version two, um, you're probably gonna wanna upgrade, um, or I should say you definitely are gonna wanna upgrade. If you can upgrade, there are some mitigations you can do um, to, 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 to protect from exploitability, but upgrading the package is 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 the best thing to do if you, if if you can, um, and but really the challenge that most organizations have is finding where they're using it. Um, this is so, so common that almost any Java application that you're running in your organization could be using this. So I'm sure there are organizations out there that have hundreds or maybe even thousands of places that they're using um, log log for J. Um, the other thing that, you know, why we think this is critical is not just because it's a remote code execution vulnerability, which of course is, is the worst kind when an attacker can run the code of their choice on your server. Um, it's uh, that, you know, the exploit is really easy, um, easy to accomplish. Uh, exploit code was also published um, early this morning, GMT time. And um, it's, a, it's a very simple string that people have been typing into uh, even Minecraft servers and getting the exploit to execute um, from a Minecraft chat window. Uh, that gives you a good idea on how, um, how easy it is to exploit. Um, so yeah, let me, let me ask a question of Giuseppe. Um, you know, how does this log4j exploit that's been published, how, how does this work? How can people get remote code execution working um, so easily on, 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 on the server they're attacking? Yeah, yeah sure. sure. The um, issue that involves um, a log4j requires also a um, few steps at the moment, even though it's very simple to exploit. As you said, it just requires a string to be written in the proper format. And then uh, that string will trigger a few steps. The first step will be inside the log4j library that will interpret that the modified string as an address of a remote LDAP server. From that, that LDAP server, as long as it's managed by the attacker, it can be possible to deploy a um, modified class that will be returned as a result of this JNDI call to the LDAP server. That class will be executed on the return on the affected server. So at the end, it's very simple to exploit this vulnerability. And it doesn't require much, just a simple string. So the attacker sets up this, um, their own uh, LDAP server with their attack payload on it, and then can go and spray these strings across the internet um, into all kinds of input fields, hoping they eventually get logged, um, which, you know, that's what logs do. They log the HTTP request, which includes all these strings. And then that string will get interpreted and there the attacker's server will get called uh, yeah. 
for, 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 for the payload. I mean, that, that seems pretty dangerous that, you know, it's the, the log libraries interpreting things and making calls over the internet. That just seems like a bad design. Yeah. <laughs> and usually uh, uh, log libraries are used to log user input. So, and those are the cases where this vulnerability is the most dangerous because you are letting your uh, uh, logging library to deal with the user input that it's never something that can be trusted. So, you know, an environment that was really locked down that didn't allow the server that's running Log4j to connect out to the internet, that would be a mitigation, right? Like if you had a... Yeah, that's something that is still being investigated. It's not sure that it can be exploited only through JNDI. It may be possible that with future analysis or going deeper in the functionalities of Log4j and the interaction with JNDI, it may be possible to execute it even when there is no outgoing connection. Yeah, so we often see that, right? Like, you know, the initial exploit is doing something which is sort of the easiest way to exploit it. And people put mitigations in place for that specific exploit, not patching their library. And then other people figure out how to say exfiltrate data or something like that. Um, oh, yeah, that's oh, right. Uh, and this is another case, especially in cases like this, it's better to go for the updated library whenever it's possible, rather than looking for temporary mitigation. Tempor temporary mitigations can be valuable only to gain time while uh, doing the proper remediation of the vulnerability. Great, so you know, why don't we uh, take some, see if we can get some questions from the audience. If anyone has any specific questions about other mitigations or what, you know, what we're seeing out there, um, you know, please feel free to, uh, to, uh, put, put questions in the chat window. Um, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, ha has been posted is people have put up honeypots and, um, you know, even early this morning, um, some of these honeypots were getting, were getting attacked. Um, and, and so we know that there's active exploitation, uh, specifically of the JDNI exploit, exploit which, was, which was published, um, we, we've been seeing those, those attacks uh, happening out there. Um, so there's a question here from Jason Curtis. So is this just the version two of the Apache log4j? Yes, as, as far as we know, um, that's true. Um, there was some chatter out there that there was some configurations, rare configurations and extensions to the 1.x version that are you know, potentially vulnerable. Um, a bigger problem though is 1.x is has been deprecated and is not supported. There's no patches for 1.x and it the, the latest version I, versions of it, I believe, have other vulnerabilities in it. So <laughs> if you're using, including remote code, so, I mean, if you're using 1.x, you might feel lucky about this mass exploitation that's going to be happening, but um, you're, you are running a vulnerable version most likely too. Um, so you're going to want, you're going to want to upgrade that. Um, so Andre G asked, how do we test our log 4J um, instances? Giuseppe, do you have a? Yeah, I think, um... Probably the safest way is not to rely only on direct testing because testing may be limited and you may be missing a particular spot that is rather vulnerable. So it's probably better to use a tool like software composition analysis to identify applications that are using the vulnerable version of a library and go for their update. Yes, yes. So software composition analysis is something that, you know, is best to be running in your pipeline so that you have an inventory of all the open source that you're using. So when an event like this happens, you can simply do a query and, and look at what applications um, that you, you've built that, that do this. Um, but other, other ways are just to search for the, search for the file name um, or use a container inspector to see if it's in a container or you can inspect an AMI if you have AMI images. Um, those are other ways to inspect for what you've, what what you may have deployed. 
Um, and I, I think that's a safer way than trying to, you know, trying to essentially scan and, and, and do the exploitation yourself because people will, if you, if you miss something in that wave, um, you, you don't know if attackers have a, are, are working on better, better exploits. So uh, we have a LinkedIn user who asked, do you expect the impact of this vulnerability to be long lasting? Because many enterprises will fail to update their application. Yeah, we have seen that in the Equifax breach where an actively exploited Struts vulnerability went untouched for months. Yeah, I, I, at least I can start first, but I'm expecting this to be something that will last months because of the difficulties an enterprise may have in promoting a fixed application to production or also start the process of reviewing the uh, portfolio of applications they have. So that's usually why you tend to have um, a risk management process in place when an event like this happens. You want to instantiate the mitigations for in, in order to deal with the immediate risk and then working in the background in order to improve everything and, and uh, put your system to the latest version. Yeah, I, I expect there's going to be a long tail here. Um, there might be applications that you have good visibility into and you, and you find rather quickly. Um, but it is challenging to find all your Java applications. The other challenge is, of course, vendor uh, applications that are written in Java. Um, you know, we, we, we saw this, you know, with, um, you know, with Heartbleed many years ago, which kind of kicked off the whole third party risk that a lot, of, a lot of vendor applications were written with the OpenSSL library and you had to wait for your vendor um, to patch that. And that could have been an appliance. It can be packaged software. Um, and I, the same thing could happen here. A lot of appliances, a lot of packaged software um, you, you use Java. So I, I would expect that um, people are gonna be asking their vendors um, when, when, when they're, when they're gonna be patched. Yeah, we, we added this particular note even in our blog that we post today with a few guidelines on how to manage the, the, uh, this vulnerability. Yes, up on the Veracode blog site, we do have um, we, we do have some instructions on how to how to look for if you're using it and and, and some mitigations if you can't patch immediately, um, and that might be something you want to send to your vendors even if you aren't using Java applications internally to make sure that they're aware that um, that this is an issue that they need to deal with. Um, you know, in a perfect world, vendors would be on top of this, um, right? Um, but there's a lot of small vendors out there with small packages and, and they might not um, be, be alert to this. Um, it seemed like there's another question here uh, from a LinkedIn user. Is there clear evidence of this vuln being exploited in the wild? Um, yeah, there definitely is. There's a, there's a, um, a, 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 a site, Gray Noise, that works on setting up honeypots for, for uh, newly discovered vulnerabilities to see if there's this mass mass exploitation, mass scanning of the internet. And, um, oh great, Chris Ang just uh, posted um, the uh, the Twitter address that's that's doing that. And, and then they said even early this morning, they, they were getting attacked across hundreds of different honeypots. Um, so, you know, I think it's because this is just so easy to exploit. It, 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 it was the attackers were able to turn around this um, re really quickly. Um, so, so another thing I want to mention was the, um, the, uh, the idea of a, of an, of an S bomb, you know, we've been talking about, you know, vendors, uh, vendors may be shipping code to you that are Java applications that are vulnerable and you kind of have to sit there and wait for them to fix it or hope that they, um, that they are uh, fixing that, but you having visibility into, the code that your vendors have shipped you, whether it's vulnerable or not, is very difficult. And um, that is one of the things that the uh, SBOM or the Software Bill of Materials um, concept is there to, 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 to fix. Um, this is something that is an emerging standard um, that um, the uh, NTIA out of the Department of Commerce has been working on for a couple of years. 
And um, it's part of uh, the, the uh, President Biden's executive order that vendors to the U.S. government will have to supply SBOMs or software bill of materials. This allows the customer to see what libraries you're using and what versions of those libraries. And this would allow a customer to really easily see, hey, this vendor needs to send me an update. And I might want to mitigate access to this application until the vendor sends an update because I know it's using a vulnerable version of Log4J. So that's a new emerging standard that helps people manage their supply chain uh, for the applications that um, they've, they've purchased. Oh, we got a new few questions. You want to jump on there, Giuseppe? Yeah. So uh, yeah, there is a mention of another Twitter post. And then, yeah, we got a question that's saying, apart from ICA, is there a specific Veracode product that could help organizations identify vulnerable instances at scale? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think Chris, do you want to go through a list or specify something? And um, what I can tell is that uh, we are working on improving the detection in order to extend our capabilities, also to better identify this type of flows. Uh, the static scan can help there, the binary scan can help there. And in future, we may add similar functionalities to other products in our portfolio. Yeah, our, our main focus has been SCA because it's really designed specifically um, for, for, for this kind of this kind of issue. Um, you know, for example, our SCA database was updated um, this morning um, with this with this new information. Um, so it, it, you know, you would, you would be, if you were using an SEA product, you would be able to know across your inventory right away and get an alert, um, on, on, on this, um, as far as static analysis is concerned, you know, this is actually a fairly, um, you know, you, you can see, um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge because by design, the user input is going into the into the logging function, um, so that's sort of by 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 design. Um, so I, I don't know if static is a good solution for this type of yeah. vulnerability. Yeah. Um, let's see. So um, yeah, someone just asked if it's log for J two dot one five dot zero to address it, and that's. You know that that's correct. That is the the, the best um, remediation if you can if if you can do that. If you can't do that, there are some mitigations you can do. That's in the blog post around um, if you're using certain versions of Java, you can um, do some configuration to turn off the kind of functionality that's being exploited. I think Giuseppe, though, correct me if I'm wrong, that's really only helping against this specific exploit, right? Are there other things that those mitigations would not work for? Yeah, some of this configuration that we mentioned as well and are uh, mentioned as a possible mitigations are uh, primarily focused on JNDI. So that may be that if in future there were, uh, this vulnerability would be exploited using some other vulnerability, internal vulnerability, these... Uh, mitigations may not be sufficient. So going for the, uh, the version 2.15.0 is probably, is definitely the best way to remediate this problem. Absolutely. Um, let's see, I don't think we have any more questions. I think we've covered most of, uh, most of the topic. I, I think that, you know, in, in, in closing, I would just say, you know, I expect there to be, you know, sort of a long tail here as vendors patch their um, software, and then that software has to be updated at, at customer sites. Um, and, and then customers who've written custom applications find sort of those nooks and crannies where they're running running little applications here and there that they, that they may not have a good inventory of um, or, or legacy applications. So um, while I'm hoping that you know everyone has a clear inventory and they can fix this over the next few days, I think it'll be a busy weekend um, for product security teams and engineering teams in Java shops. Um, I expect this to be going on for, for, for quite a while and uh, attackers to, to still be 
able to find exploitable sites, you know, weeks and maybe even months from now. I don't know if you have any final final thoughts, Giuseppe. Yeah, Chris, definitely I agree with you. I expect this to be a long story and I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, network devices or appliances or even security appliances that may be vulnerable in future. Absolutely. So um, as we get more information, um, we're going to keep updating the blog post and maybe we'll do another live session at some point. Uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in and um, uh, get patching. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.